it's this this presentation is going to be recorded from my end your the uh, attendees have been muted so if you use the question box I'll get to your questions as soon as I can if you can hold them till the end that'll be a little more convenient so we can go through it but if you have an urgent question please feel free to ask so good morning everybody this is Eric Pearson senior cybersecurity engineer at Exeter and this is a presentation an expanded presentation to one I gave a little over a year ago on barrier devices used in the industrial control network and I've, expa I've expanded the content of this because of the deep packet inspection technology so I'm going to be focusing on that more as we move forward with the additional webinars so a little background on me my name is Eric Pearson I've been in both in, uh, enterprise side IT and also industrial networking IT for quite a while I've spent time in as the IT manager for a number of multinational companies and also worked for Gould Monocon and uh, MTL which is now part of Eaton Cooper Kraus Heinz doing their industrial networking um, I've gone through a number of certification programs and am in the process of going through more so so many of the presentations that have been offered before have covered the need for either the cybersecurity assessment, the risk assessment, how to do those processes. And it's, while it's not common knowledge how to do them, it is presented in a number of webinars, ones I've done and others at Exeter have done. What this webinar is intended, on cover, intended to cover is what happens after that assessment is over and what, hap what you need to do in order to help secure your network. So ISA IEC 62443, which is was previously or is also known as the ISA 99 series of documents, covers two major processes which need to occur. The first is the cybersecurity risk assessment. The high-level assessment identifies and prioritizes the systems or the functions which are either most critical to your entire process or most vulnerable. Once you do the high level and you find out what systems you want to focus your efforts on, you then move to, at some point in time, a detailed risk assessment. The detailed risk assessment goes through and identifies the areas in the process or the actual devices which are controlling the process, which may either be most vulnerable or most critical, or just low-hanging fruit, and you can take care of those really easily and really not spend too much time on them. Also included in the, the 99 series of documents is the need for a cybersecurity vulnerability assessment. The, this assessment identifies where your plans and the installation differ from the best practices in whatever standard or regulation you're required to follow. As a general rule, when we do an assessment, we follow the ISA 99 or the 62443 series of documents because they are industry agnostic. We can tailor them to meet whatever the needs of your particular installation is. So it makes it a lot easier versus some of the other standards or some of the other regulations that have been written which are tailored to a specific industry. And while you can use them in other industries, it takes a little bit more finessing because you have to, you have to move out of what they're designed for into what you want to use them for. So once you finish the actual assessment, most often the mitigation recommendations or the solutions request or require some sort of ne network segmentation or separation. So the network separation, they almost always occur because generally we still find very flat or unseparated or unsegmented networks within the industrial control system. Some of the steps which need to be done are performing zoning conduit exercises on your existing network to see where the, the common areas of security or common areas of functionality are, and identify and protect the most critical assets or groups of assets. And a lot of this is being done, and I'll cover this again in a minute, is because a lot of the devices on the industrial control systems are still fragile. They still, their Ethernet ports cannot handle the traffic that a computer can handle, and so they just do not like being on a regular wide open network. So as an example, and this is a little bit of an extreme example, but we have seen things like this in the past. You have your enterprise architecture going out to the internet. You have three plants connected to that enterprise architecture somehow going down to your control system. And from there, you go pretty much straight down to your layers one and layer zero devices, your actual PLCs and your IO. 
And this is not uncommon. This has been seen in the field. Also, in the, the essentially the layer two level, there's a number of servers which are dual homed, connecting to two separate networks. The problem with that, it's the least secure method of separating or segmenting your network. Because if a situation should occur somewhere on your plant and it gets into these servers, it automatically is allowed to propagate across both networks. And if you look at the network structure, it's actually been bypassing the dual home server. Hopefully there's a some sort of advice in there keeping loops out of your network. So again, this is a relatively extreme example, but something similar to this has been seen when we've done our assessments. So once you, once you get into the actual work, you begin looking at your network. You separate your network into critical devices or zones. And then you use some sort of a barrier device, a conduit, to limit the traffic that flows from zone to zone. My recommendation, and, and many, many others, is that you absolutely strive to separate your Windows components from your non-Windows components. In this case, it would be your SCADA system, your HMI, your operator or engineering workstations, things like that, your Windows operating system. From devices that do not run the Windows operating system, like your PLCs, chart recorders, scales, um, devices that do not like the amount of chatter that Windows can produce. And Windows produces a lot of broadcast chatter on your network. So by the time you get to the actual end devices, your PLCs, your scales, etc., the only traffic or protocols that are flowing to these devices are the protocols that are required by those devices. It could be Modbus, it could be Ethernet IP, it could be DNP3, whatever it happens to be. It is only the traffic that these devices require. You'll actually be able to watch, the, the as dumb as it sounds, the idiot lights on your network ports go from flashing crazy to blinking on and off at a very slow rate. You, you actually see the difference when you start implementing this separation. So now we've taken our enterprise, our bad example, and we've gone through and we've separated it into zoning conduits. So at the enterprise zone at the top, we have a firewall and a router going out to the internet again. And going down to each of what used to be the plants, we now have given them a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. And we're saying that only traffic from the enterprise zone can reach that, that DMZ area. We've then put another firewall between the DMZ and each of the control zones within each plant. And then we've put another firewall in front of their, our actual control devices, our PLCs. And at that point, like I mentioned earlier, only the protocols that are required to run those devices are being allowed to flow through to those end devices. If we go back up to the firewall between the plant control zone and the enterprise zone, the whole idea of that, that architecture is that from the plant zone, it's allowed to talk to the DMZ. From the enterprise zone, they're allowed to talk to the DMZ, but your router and firewall combinations there do not allow the control zone and the enterprise zone to directly communicate to each other. There are a number of best practices which have been called out on how to segment and to lay out those firewall and router setups. Those won't be discussed during this, this webinar, but there are ways that are recommended to do it as far as best practice. So this is a much cleaner architecture as far as controlling how your, your data flow is going to happen. You have your separation of your zones, you have your firewall controlling your traffic, you're routing your traffic so it only goes where you know it's going to go, and your end devices are only getting the protocols that they need to run their process. All right, so now we've told you what to do. That was really simple. We've drawn pretty boxes, we've drawn lines, and we've done our paper exercise. So the next big question is how do you actually do it? And as with any question, I have a simple question, but the answer takes forever. So the laying out or the actual implementation of these devices takes a level of expertise and a level of, of knowledge of both your network and how networks work in general. We can help with this, but it can be done relatively easily. So the first step is to evaluate and choose the solution that you want to use. There are a number of vendors that offer barrier devices, industrial barrier devices. There are more being offered every week. Who do you already have a relationship with? If, if we come in the door and say, oh, you need to buy vent vendor B, well, you already have a relationship with vendor A. If they offer a suitable solution, by all means, go with the vendor that you're familiar with, you're comfortable with, and you have a history with. We are not there to sell you any products. So 
we are familiar with the number of products that are offered, but we're not going to sell you one. What our goal is, is to create a secure network, however that's going to happen. But you need to look at your network and understand it. Do you have FTE, or Honeywell's fault tolerant Ethernet, or any other proprietary redundancy solution which can be created at the switch level or at the device level? What's your primary control protocol? Is it Modbus TCP and is deep packet inspection needed on your network? Is it Ethernet IP? And again, is deep packet inspection required? Do you run OPC? Can you firewall it with the equipment that you have in place right now? OPC is a firewall's nightmare, but it can be firewalled. It is possible. What other protocols are you running? Sh are, is, are unacceptable protocols running on your network, such as web traffic, video traffic, voice traffic? They shouldn't be, but they've been seen. What other industrial protocols are running on your network? Do you need any specialized applications, such as a VPN layout, such as network address translation or NATing? Do you have VLANs running? Um, do you have multiple users that need to log in to get different permissions? All of these can be accounted for with your network, so with your industrial barrier solution. Again, a number of vendors are supplying industrial control system firewalls to the market. Some of the difference between the industrial control and a standard enterprise level switch or firewall is the industrial form factor and robustness. These are convection cooled. They do not have fans. They generally run off a 12 to 48 volt DC power supply and have redundant power supplies. They are made to withstand extended temperature ranges, extended humidity, in either direction, they're made to run in an environment that an, that an industrial control system is made to run in. They also have functionality built in that understands industrial protocols, where you don't have to go guess what port it uses. If it knows the protocol, you can just call it up by name. They, the designing of the rule sets is much more intuitive and easier to do by somebody that is not inherently familiar with firewalling technology, which can be a very complex technology and a very complex uh, configuration and rule set. Some of the vendors who supply some of these firewalls, there's the Tofino family, manufactured by a number of, of or uh, sold by a number of manufacturers. There's the new Hirschman Xenon Tofino. Moxa has two available in the market, the EDRG 8XX and the 9XX. MTL has a Tofino solution available. Phoenix Contact has a network firewall solution available. Siemens Scalens. Honeywell has a CF9 made for their um, fault tolerant Ethernet, and a number of others who are out there in the market. Again, pick the vendor who you are familiar with and working with. Um, a number of vendors make firewalls for their specific networks. Use those because most likely implementation is going to be much easier because they're already designed to go in their network architecture. So some general requirements to make your life a whole lot easier once you start implementing these is that they have predefined protocol lists for industrial protocols. They know what, for example, Modbus is and how it works. They know what Ethernet IP, what DNP3 is, what FTE is, the Delta V protocols, they know what all these are already and you can simply select them out of a list instead of having to define them yourselves. The screens are simple and intuitive in all cases. They have stateful firewall functionality that will handle both TCP, which is a connection-oriented communication, and UDP, which is a connectionless oriented communication. They should be able to handle non-IP protocols. There are many industrial protocols out there that are not IP. They should have some sort of rate limiting functionality and be able to either allow or deny those non-IP protocols. Many commercial level or enterprise level firewalls can't handle the non-IP protocols and they simply block them by default or pass them by default depending on their internal designs. That's not acceptable in the industrial network arena. You need to be able to control what happens. And again, they are designed to go in in an industrial network with temperature, DIN mountable, convection cooling, etc. all the things that I've mentioned earlier. So they're made to, to be used by a person that is not in an enterprise networking group. 
some device specifics on devices that I've had a chance to look at and review. Um, I've called up a, a couple of categories which were important for my industrial network reviews that I was doing. So in this case, we have Modbus D packet inspection, Ethernet IP D packet inspection, an OPC firewall, whether it can do natting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then some of the the uh, configuration of technologies available to these devices. So I've looked at the Tofino family, both of the Moxa series, the Phoenix Contact, and the Hirschman Eagle One, and I've laid out in this chart what they can do. This webinar, this initial webinar, is primarily an overview of firework, firewalling technology with a focus on the deep packet inspection that's going to come. And so future webinars are going to actually focus on devices which allow deep packet inspection and how it's actually configured. So this gives you an ex a, uh, a quick review of what functionality is available with the deep packet inspection firewalls. So if you look at Modbus DPI, the Tofinos and the Moxes both offer the Modbus deep packet inspection. The newer Tofino family, the Xenon product, offers an Ethernet IP deep packet inspection. And the Tofino and the, the new Phoenix uh, Contact MGuard offer OPC firewalling. And I'll get into what all of those will do in a few minutes. So we're going to go through some examples of how these devices are set up, how easy they are, and what it's, and some of the functionality that, that can be gleaned from them. So in this case, this is the MOXA EDR G902 firewall, which can be a Layer 2 or Layer 3 firewall. Layer 2 is non-routing, a local area network. A Layer 3 is a routing protocol. So in this case, we're showing that from the WAN side to the LAN side, we're going to allow Modbus and we're going to allow HTTP, which is web access, from spe specific devices. And because it knows what these protocols are, if you look on the left, it says Quick Automation Profile. It understands what Modbus is. It knows what ports it uses. And it knows that it's a TCP protocol by default. So it can lay all that information in for you with you simply clicking on a line and doing insert. And it's very simple to do. The last rule in all firewalls should be a drop a deny, preferably a deny and log, because that way you see what rules, what traffic has not matched the rules that you put in place. You get a log of it and you can see if something is going on in your network that shouldn't be going on in your network or something has changed possibly. That was, This is the layer three level by the way. The layer two firewall, again the non-routing or, or non-IP based rules, these are some of the protocols which the MOXA firewall can, can, can understand. In this case, ARP traffic, um, NetBuoy, which is still very common on, on most Windows networks. Um, let me see, which ones are important? IPv6 and IPv4 transmissions. So this is very easy, again, to put in place, click on what you want, and say, hey, we're done. All industrial firewall, firewalls should offer some level of denial of service protection stopping too much traffic from reaching your end devices, which can cause very serious problems. So in this case, you can check what you want to you want to have the firewall stop. Good idea to put in pretty much all of them. The Tofino, a very graphic screen where you put in your devices you want to communicate and the, the protocols you want to pass through. This has denial of service protection as well, where you select what's called a special rule, and you put that in your usually a global setting to limit the amount of traffic which will get through to your end devices. The Xenon firewall, very similar layout. It gives you a very clean, very graphic-oriented screen. And it has denial of service protection. The burst is how many will be allowed initially, and then the rate limit takes effect after that burst happens. An example of that is when you first power up your system and everybody's trying to do ARPs to figure out where everybody is on the network, that burst limit allows the network to, to identify itself to each other. Once that happens, the rate limit takes effect and it lowers additional, additional traffic. Phoenix Contact MGuard, it has, similar to the, um, the MOXA, has a web-based interface to it. So this is an example of the rule sets for the, for the Phoenix Contact. And again, it has denial of service protection on the network. 
with again, and I'll say it again, I repeat it a bunch of times, but with these end devices, it is extremely important that you limit the amount of traffic that gets to them. We can emulate very easily simply by creating a broadcast storm a PLC just simply failing, corrupting, flashing its outputs on and off, it's very easy to do. And in the real life, in a real industrial system, that could be catastrophic. So we've identified our device. We know who we're going to use. Second step is receive training on these devices. The, tra the training should be, you should have an understanding of networking technology in general. What networking, how it's laid out, what devices go in the network, what they do what they're capable of doing, what they're not capable of doing, what barrier devices you intend to use, how they work, because they all work different, a little bit differently. And then test scenarios of making and breaking your network um, architecture to see how the different rules will affect what's happening on your network. This is done on a demo box or a test network, not on a live network. Now start investigating. Once, you fami once you're familiar with what a network is like, how the traffic works, what your device is doing, now we, and you feel comfortable with what you do, what it, what it will do to your network, like adding rules, taking out rules, things like that, now we can install these on your live or a test network which emulates your production facility. Not blocking traffic, simply looking at what's going on on the network. Determine what we need to allow to pass, what we need to block, and in some cases there's nothing we can do with it. So deny no log it. Don't tell us every time it happens. I can't do anything about it. It's always going to be there. Windows traffic is a good example of that. You can't stop that from happening. But you don't want your logs filling up with Windows traffic because you know it's there anyway. So you do a deny no log on that traffic. So you block it to go to your end device, but you don't tell you your logging system every time you get a Windows NetBuoy traffic. And again, we've, we've done a number of trainings on a variety of these solutions. So within the investigation phase is being able to see what's happening on your network. Some sort of a port mirroring is a great answer to that because it allows you to take a port that, you, that a device is connected to, mirror it to a second port, and then look at that traffic on that port. If you're familiar with network switching technology, under normal situations, the only ports that are active are the ports that are communicating. So in this this picture, we're showing a firewall talking to a switch with a PLC, looks like on port 6. Well, if something coming in from the outside world was talking to the PLC, it would only go out port 6. The only information that the Wireshark machine would see would be broadcast or multicast traffic. All of the specific PLC traffic would only be going out the port going to the PLC. By creating a sniffing port, all traffic that would have been flowing out port 6 is now mirrored on port 1. That port now takes on a special characteristic. And now the Wireshark is going to see everything going on in that network port. Integrated sniffing within a firewall is another functionality which is available on some firewalls where when you put the firewall in place, you'll see the traffic passing through it. It's very convenient. You don't have to create the Wireshark mirror at that point. But Wireshark is an extremely valuable tool. We use it all the time. So in some of these examples that I've pulled up, in this case, I've got some unwanted multicast traffic going on across the network. I've got some IPv6 going on. I've got some logical link layer stuff going on. I've got internet group membership going on. All sorts of stuff that I don't want to get to my end devices, and they're going to. In the middle one, I've got Ethernet IP real um, process control traffic going on. And on the bottom one, there's Delta V traffic. Uh, in this case, the end ports in all cases are multicast addresses, so this is actually occurring as a broadcast on your network. So to give a little information on some of the industrial protocols if you're not familiar with them, Ethernet IP stands for Ethernet Industrial Protocol. We're all familiar with TCP IP, where TCP is Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. That's one protocol. Ethernet Industrial Protocol is a specific protocol that has been developed by AB and is used for their devices. The IP in this case stands for Industrial Protocol. It is confusing when pe some people talk about it, but it's a specific Industrial Protocol. It's Ethernet-based protocol based on Control and Information Protocol, or CIP. And as with other, all other Ethernet protocols, the speed of the, the network 
is determines the speed of your process. Most networks are 100 megabit full duplex. There's many one gigabit out there right now. There's some 10 gigabit, which are relatively slow in, in today's age, but they're still out there. So this good acceptance of Ethernet IP and more uh, vendors are, are moving towards it because AB is such a dominant player in the industrial control space. It was originally developed by Rockwell, and now it's managed by the ODVA, the Open Device Net Vendors Association. It uses two methods of communication. Implicit messaging, which is produce a subscriber, one person talks, and those who need to receive the message. It's typically multicast or unicast for I.O. transfer, and it uses port 2222. It's very seldom you will see this communication on a industrial network only because this is generally the I.O. messages. Generally, this is at a lower level and hopefully on a separated network or a segregated network. The explicit messaging, the port 44818, is the client to server, the HMI to PLC. That's generally the communication that occurs on the industrial network that you can see at the HMI level or at the, um, the, the firewalling level. This is usually the communication that the deep packet inspection modules work with. If you see 2222 on an industrial network, the first thing I would look at is, is to see how that network was segmented because there probably could be some more work done on that network to isolate the traffic. So in this case, Wireshark understands Ethernet IP. It knows what the protocol is and it knows what the message information is inside the frames. So at the top one I'm looking at a list identity request and the bottom I'm looking at a list identity response. So I can actually see the communication going on within Wireshark to see what Ethernet IP is trying to do. This is another example of simply capturing with Wireshark or I can list my services of the device and I get a response. And, and again Wireshark understands the Ethernet IP protocol to tell you what the protocol is trying to do. Next we're going to discuss very quickly Modbus TCP. It's very similar to the older Modbus RTU. It's developed by Modicon. It's an open, it's a, a public um, protocol. Many, many, many devices use it. It's the TCP <coughs> requires an IP address on both ends or some sort of a gateway that holds the IP address and then serial devices can be behind that. Both are used very commonly. The TCP protocol uses port 502. It's a master-slave functionality and for those that know computers really well, the master-slave functionality, functionality is conceptually reversed from what normally would be considered a client-server functionality. So keep that in mind when you're discussing it. In computer land, the client is the one that makes the request to the server. In Modbus land, the master is the one that makes the, the request to the slave. In Modbus TCP, the function codes or responses are identical to Modbus RTU, which is the serial, except they're encapsulated within Ethernet frames, and it runs as fast as the underlying Ethernet network can support. Again, usually 100 meg full duplex, but very often you can have one gig out there running just fine. Some quick examples of how Modbus works is there are different function codes which are encapsulated within the message. Those function codes tell the slave what the master wants, whether it's a read, whether it's a write, whether it's a single device, whether it's a multiple or single coil or register, whether it's multiple coils or register, or whether it's a programming command. So once you enable port 502, which is Modbus, you can do anything because you are allowed to pass information or pass requests to that end device and that is the beginning of the problem. So in this case here's a few sample function codes for Modbus. Read coil, read input status, etc. There are other ones that are actually program codes. It's actually a stop processing code that you can find. Once the request is sent to the slave, the Modbus slave executes the command and simply sends the information back to the master who requests it and it says this was my address, my slave address, which is usually zero if it's on a TCP what the function code you asked me for and here's the information that you've asked for. Now again with Modbus and a standard stateful firewall it all uses port 502 and it's all going just back and forth across the net. There's no way to control what that master and slave communication can actually do. Wireshark 
knows and understands the Modbus protocol. So if you look at Modbus on a Wireshark or look at with Wireshark, look at Modbus, you can actually see what the function code is and what the information going out and coming back is. So on the top of this, I show a, a function code write multiple coils, function code 15, and my data is FF, turn the coil on. My response is, here's what you wanted to do, here's what we've done. The bottom um, Wireshark capture is a to read holding registers, function code 3, and I want to read 20 registers. So in this case, my response is, here's, here's your function code 3, here's your information of those registers. So because I'm, in Mo again, in Modbus, I can send this traffic back and forth just fine and nobody's stopping me. If I do something that's illegal to the Modbus slave, it sends back a response which is incremented by 80. So if you look at the function code 16, slave address 5, function code 16, for some reason, the Modbus slave couldn't perform that operation. It doesn't have those registers, doesn't have the address, whatever the reasoning is, it increments the function code by 80. So it sends back, I'm number 5, my response is 96. 80 plus the 16 saying, I couldn't do what you asked me to do. And the reason is in the next exception code block. And in this case, it was an illegal data address. So the slave didn't hold the addresses that the master was asking for. Most IP protocols communicate using the same fixed port numbers. We've talked about Ethernet IP using 44818 and 2222, and we've talked about Modbus TCP talking about 502. That's the general way protocols work. They communicate on port on their port, they get a response on their port, and those two that, that type of communication takes place all day long. But there's an exception to every rule, and I'm just repeating what the slide now shows. That exception to the rule in the process control industry is called OPC Classic, and many, many, many people use OPC Classic. OPC breaks the rules by making a request on a known port, it's always port 135, and it gets an answer on port 135, however the answer is not the data that the mat, that the client was looking for. The response is actually another port number. Once it gets this response, it closes the initial communication on port 135 and begins the data communication on that port that it was told to go to. Theoretically, that port response and the new data port can be anything between 1024 and 65535. There are a few ways to control that, but in general, it can be almost any port that's available within the Windows environment. That makes firewalling an OPC classic transmission very difficult until new technologies have come out to solve it. One new technology which has not been adopted into the industrial control system yet is OPC UA. OPC UA is universal architecture does not rely on Microsoft's DCOM, which means it can be used on almost any platform, where OPC Classic was dedicated to the Microsoft platform because of the underlying technology that it uses. OPC UA uses SOAP and XML over HTTP. It's a single port, it's very fast communication, it's device agnostic, it's, it's a very good solution for OPC but again, it has not really been adopted in the industrial control system yet. Because of the way it's been written, it has security built into it, it's got encryption built into it, it has redundancy built into it, it's a very robust, secure technology. Once it, once it starts being rolled out into the industrial control system world, it's going to be a, a really nice solution to OPC traffic. I've already said OPC and standard protocol, or redundancy and standard protocol, so just repeating what was the slides, just repeating what I already said. So now we've identified our, our devices. Now we're going to start putting it in. We're going to start seeing what happens on our network and start laying out our firewalling technology. This demo uh, was done using the Argon Tofino. 
which was the last generation of Tofino. The Tofino line has been replaced with the Xenon series, but this has been this has all been done with the the Argon level, just so everybody knows. So in this case, we're going to develop the network. We're going to lay it out within the the Tofino screen to create a virtual network. Now we're going to go in and we're going to install our modules or activate our modules within the firewalling device. The Tofino has a number of different modules available. You buy and activate them based on what your requirements are. Other vendors do it in slightly different ways, but the end result is very similar. Like the Moxa has the Modbus uh, DPI built into its, its firmware. The Phoenix Contact has the OPC built into its latest version of the firmware, and then you have to license that. So we usually when you put a firewall in place and you tell it to to log your, your entries, if you don't put any rules in, it's basically going to try to block everything. But if you don't actually block it, but you allow it to go to some sort of a monitoring device, you can get a firewall sniffer. This is the other way of doing it instead of using Wireshark, where Wireshark gives you the PC-based mirrored port. This is using the traffic that's flowing through the firewall to be able to, to look at what your traffic is and create your, your associated rule sets. This is where the fun begins. This is actually a lot of fun doing this for a geek. So in this case, some traffic is pretty much obvious. It tells us it's Modbus. It tells us what the device that's trying to communicate and the device that's being communicated to. And you, you, by using this, you can begin to set up your rules. But the first question is, is do you want these, is this the device that you expected to be communicating? Sometimes you have to look at some of the oddities on the network. Then you also have a ton of non-IP traffic. The non-IP traffic is MAC address based, does not have an IP address. It is all over your local area network. Whether you, whether you realize it or not, your network is very, very busy with both IP and non-IP traffic. So in this case, we have a device which is doing spanning tree protocol. It's trying to set up redundant links. Are we redundant down to the end devices? Probably not. Are, are we redundant down to the switch in front of the end devices? It could go both ways on that one. But let's say we're not. Okay, well, somebody is configured to be looking for my redundant paths. So the first thing is I want to block it. The second thing is I really want to go find out what device is creating this traffic. Because if I can shut it off, I've cleaned my network up. And the, the goal of this, these exercises is not simply to see or not see the traffic that's occurring on your network. It's actually to clean your network up, to stop the, the erroneous traffic which is flowing and not have it on your network to begin with because you're freeing up bandwidth. So in this case, we have a 6-net device that's, that's been configured to look for spanning tree. Well, we have the MAC address of it. By using the first three octets of the MAC address is how I identified that it was a 6-net device. So now I can go find this device, configure it, and shut off spanning tree and possibly some other protocols that are going on in it. In this case, I again have devices sending broadcast messages across the network. That broadcast message is a reverse ARP protocol trying to equate a MAC address or IP address to a MAC address, where ARP equates an IP address. Did I say that right? ARP equates an IP address to a MAC address. Reverse ARP equates a MAC address to an IP address. I'm saying it backwards. A MAC address to an IP address. There we go. Now I said it right. So in this case, can we go in and find this MOXA device and get rid of this reverse ARP protocol? Because this is sending traffic all over the network. Reverse ARPs may or may not be necessary on the network. So what you're trying to do is get rid of all of this noise from getting through to your end devices. And if you're monitoring it, you want to get rid of all the noise that's coming into your, your monitoring device because you're simply cluttering up your screen with unneeded traffic. And the whole goal is to see the important traffic, but not the garbage. So in this case, we've gone through all of our exercises. And the only thing we're seeing flowing through right now is Modbus. So we've got rid of all of our extra traffic that's being logged, so now we can look at the real stuff. So now we put the mod, in this case, the Modbus rule in to allow the traffic to flow, and our logging system is now clean. It's not receiving a bunch of traffic 
that we can't deal with or it's so much that it's just overwhelming to try to look for the real traffic. So now we have a clean logging system where now if an event occurs on your network and you start getting log entries, you now know you have to do something about it. Or you know that something has changed on your network that you need to start investigating. Maybe somebody plugged something in they shouldn't have plugged in. Maybe a device has gone bad and started chattering on your network. But now you have a clean system to start looking at. So the next steps. You've got your firewall functionality in place. You've limited your traffic to a to the or multiple industrial protocol industrial protocols that are required to run your system. Now you need to look if you want to implement the deep packet inspection, and you need to look at what that deep packet inspection is trying to do. I'm going to be setting up a number of webinars over the coming months, which will actually go into detail of a number of the vendors' offerings for deep packet inspection. I'll be going over who they are, what they offer, and show examples on how to configure them. But it would have been too long a presentation today if I had put it all into one. So keep your eyes open for announcements about upcoming webinars that I'll be doing, and I hope you find them interesting, because it's a lot of fun working with the deep packet inspection. So some final steps. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Yep. So some final steps that we're going to be looking at, or you should do is let your other people know that you're going to be doing work on your control networks. Let the operations group know that they sh could see their um, screens flash every a little bit because you're going to be creating network breaks when you insert the device. Allow a period of time to run the data to collect the traffic so that you know what's happening on your network. You're going to see the good traffic but there's also a really good chance you're going to see traffic that you don't know what it is or you don't know where it's coming from. And you're going to find devices that have been put on your network that really shouldn't be there. It happens almost every time I've done network assessments. Set the rules to active on the device to lock down the network so that you know only the required traffic is flowing to your end devices. And then have the operations group test the functions and communications to make sure it does what they want it to do. Do this on an, as non a critical process first as you can so that you become comfortable and familiar with how to configure these devices. Then move on to the next one and work on that one. Don't try to take them on all at once. Do one or two at a time, work slowly, understand what you're doing, feel comfortable, and then move on to the next. And then work your way up to the critical processes, whether it's done during an outage or whether you schedule it in during operations time. Most of these devices are designed to be plugged in and will simply pass traffic when they're first plugged in. So they will not interrupt your process of control environment. That's why you, and why you do this on a test installation or a demo box first, so you get familiar and comfortable that what you're going to do is not going to disrupt your network operation. So in conclusion, the assessment was the first step. It told you where you were, what you've done right, what you need to do better at. Work with vendors you already know. If you already work with vendor A and they offer a solution, by all means keep working with them. Don't jump ships in the middle of the river because you're, you're going to create new relationships. You're already comfortable with someone. Again, if they have a solution that will work, by all means work with them. Get training. Baseline networking knowledge is imperative when you start working with these devices. You need to know how a network works and you need to know how your network works. Every network is unique. It's, it's created and developed with the personality of the person that did it. When I walk in the door, I have never seen two networks designed exactly the same way, and I have to learn, just like you, what your network is trying to do. These devices are not difficult. They're not hard, especially if you know some networking. But they are new to you. They're configured differently, they're laid out differently, the technology is different. So get training on the devices so you know how they work and what to expect. Um, we can help you with most devices. And the big caveat is to implement these devices correctly is a great thing for your network. But to implement them incorrectly not only can give a false sense of security, but if, if you do not account for all the traffic, can unexpectedly have adverse effects and possibly catastrophic effects to your network if devices can't communicate. So it takes a little bit of time to make sure you've got them right. Make sure you have the time to do it. 
So I'd like to thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, this was essentially the higher level to start talking about how firewalls work. We will start talking about some specific deep packet inspection firewalls that are available in upcoming webinars over the, over the coming months. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the box and I'll answer them. And if you don't, I thank you for your time and remaining online and listening to me. So I'll wait a few minutes to see if anybody sends anything out. Okay, I've got a couple. Um, let me see. Can you please share those devices that offer the ability to self-learn versus having the engineer figure out what needs to pass? Um, most of the industrial control system devices are not at the point where they self-learn. Generally, the ones that self-learn are, are uh, intrusion detection type of device, but not these, none of these firewalls actually have the ability to self-learn. I believe that, let me think about this a second, the new Tofino Xenon may be able may have this functionality built into it but I haven't used it yet so I'm not a hundred percent sure of it um, I'll actually dig into that and see if any of them can but none of them off the top of my head can actually self-learn and implement um, it, it but a correlation to that it is not I, I, I've done many of these installations I've probably done over a hundred trainings and implementations on these devices anywhere from two to hundred and fifty of them and my training has never gone more than three days and that includes network and device training it is not difficult to figure out what needs to pass because generally when you get down to this level you do not have like your enterprise firewalls and have a hundred or even a thousand rules you have two to five or ten pass rules and everything else is deny rules so it is it is generally very easy to set these things up. What makes it even easier in a lot of cases is I mentioned earlier that some vendors have manufactured or developed these devices to go into their specific network infrastructures. Emerson has one, Honeywell has, Honeywell has one, um, Honeywell has a number and they're actually pre-programmed to go into, I'll get back to you Joe, to go into the their specific environments. Um, I understand the segment frame packet inspection transport, but how can you inspect data at the physical level, the bits? These don't inspect it at the bit level, not externally. The, the deep packet inspection goes in and looks at what the function code or the, the um, package is going through. They don't look at the bits except for a sanity check. What they look at is the function code that's allowed to pass back and forth okay so they don't actually look at it to the user level at the bits themselves uh, okay a lot of questions so I'll get to them as fast as I can if I can't hear anything I assume at this point you've heard something um, Okay, is a LOPA needed while doing a risk assessment of the overall network architecture to receive a SIL rating? The LOPA and the SIL rating is at the safety level, which is part of your process safety management. So yes, you would do that at that level. In the cybersecurity assessment, which is part of the process safety management, we use that input to look at it, but we don't actually do a LOPA and create a SIL rating on the cybersecurity side of things. Again, that's done, on your, that's done within the safety realm. Which we, uh, which we can talk about offline. If you contact Exeter, we can, they can talk to you about that. That's not where I, um, where I, what my area is. Uh, audio is unstable, like to view the recorded version. Again, if you talk, um, get a hold of the, the um, email which was given on the invitation, Courtney is going, or our marketing group is going to send out the link to the recorded um, presentation. What kind of pricing does Exeter have for training? 
If you again contact Ex contact Exeter via the web page, or you can contact me directly at e Pearson p e r s s o n at exeter.com, or the uh, email which was sent on the invitation or on our website, we'll be happy to talk to you about this. Um, it'd be too, there's, there's a number of classes available, so it'd be too much to go into now. There's networking classes, life cycle classes, um, one day overviews. I can customize it for your particular environment. So it's very easy. It would be, be better to talk to you about that offline. Uh, Skater or DCS? DCNS have dozens of protocols. Yes, they do. But what I'm talking about are the protocols that are getting down to the end devices, like a PLC, which is usually a very limited set of protocols. I'm not talking about an edge firewall in this case, which does have a bunch of stuff happening, without a doubt. And I, I wouldn't even get into that in this kind of a discussion. But when you are talking about a PLC or an end device, which is where these firewalls are intended to go, that type of thing, those type of, of communications are very limited in what protocols they use. They use. Hope that answered that question, Joel. If not, send me another one. Be happy to. Is there there is a lot of misunderstanding about DMZ? Can you please explain in brief what a DMZ is, the industrial network environment? The absolutely. The DMZ stands for demilitarized zone. The DMZ is they also called it a semi-trusted network versus trusted and untrusted. A DMZ is an area that's been set up in your network where limited communication will occur and essentially a data transfer area, for lack of a better quick term to think of, where your enterprise zone is allowed to communicate to servers in the DMZ and your process control zone is allowed to communicate to servers within the DMZ. But the enterprise zone is not allowed to communicate directly with the process control zone and vice versa. So let's talk about um, patching, whatever patching you want to talk, one we want to put in, but I'll generically call it patching, where from the DMZ, excuse me, I could pull down my patches and put them on a staging server in the DMZ. Then from the process control side, I can pull down my servers, my patches from a server from that staging server in the DMZ, and my process control network did not have to go up to the enterprise or the internet to get those patches. So it's an area that both sides can communicate to, but neither can communicate to each self, each other directly. The other little best practice is whatever protocol you're communicating from the enterprise to the DMZ is not the same protocol from the um, DCS or the, the industrial control side to the DMZ. So you don't inadvertently create an unwanted path flowing from one side to the other. I hope that answered that. If not, send me another note. Uh, what's the device app on the identify traffic slide? Lots of yellow. That's actually part of the original Tofino CMP, um, the Argon CMP, which has again been replaced by the Xenon, which is a new version of it. The other slides were Wireshark, but the original Tofino sent heartbeat messages to the CMP to allow you to see the traffic. Uh, are you hiring in Houston, Texas? You'll have to contact the Exeter offices to answer that one, if you would please. Um, let me see. Never mind the ident traffic. I see, okay, state. I see, Michael. I'm not sure what you're asking. If that's still a question, but I never mind the ident traffic. I see with Sniffer app, stateful traffic. Okay, I'm good. Good enough, Mike. Got it. Uh, let me. Thanks. Got to feel a wire shark. Okay. <laughs> um, do you think IC62 will become a de facto standard in the future for cybersecurity assessments? I think it already has. Only because it has been. I mean, I, I've been worldwide, and it has been accepted worldwide. Uh, I'm just jump. Mike, you sent 10Q. Um, is that thank you, or are you asking a question? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, that it, there, okay, got it. You're welcome, Mike. Um, there are a number of um, standards and regulations available. 
Um, and they, they, many of them are industry specific, like NERC SIP and the 800 series, but they are all very, very similar. So I think that 62443 is heading in a direction where it will become the de facto, it will become a, a, a worldwide standard. Um, I think it has some work, I believe it has some work to do, and they are working on it, and so it's moving forward. Um, but I think it has been pretty well accepted worldwide right now. I, I, I don't know of any other that will be better specifically for it, specifically for cybersecurity right now, for the industrial control system. Um, let me see. All right, I'm getting 643 doesn't address assessments, lots of work needed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's re relatively generic. It does not go into detail. What it says is you need to do it. It doesn't tell you how to do it or what you should do, which is why the, uh, this wasn't meant to be a sales, but which is why Exeter has developed an assessment protocol that we do both for risk assessments and vulnerability assessments. And we have developed a, a methodology and a protocol to go into an industrial network situation, and that's all we focus on, our industrial network situations, to do risk and vulnerability assessments, where we've taken 62443 as a template, which is what it is, and we've created our protocol to create the, um, the, the vulnerability assessments. Um, let me see. Great for management system, but standards lack security assessment methodology. NIST is light there as well. Yeah, it is. So... Um, let me see. Please let me know what standards, what some standard textbook to study for the CACS and CACE exam. The CACS and CACE exams have been based on a fundamental understanding of networking, industrial networking in general, and the cybersecurity life cycle as it was originally developed. That's going through some modifications as well and some enhancements. But if you understand industrial networking and you understand or can be trained in the cybersecurity lifecycle, that's what those certif cert these um, certification exams are based on. Um, we do offer I, the networking and the cybersecurity lifecycle courses. It's a one day and then a t for the networking and a two day for the the lifecycle courses, which will give you the foundation knowledge required for those two uh, certifications. Are you on any of the ISA committees? I am on the ones for, let me think of which ones. I was on one, but I haven't been to it because I've been, been bit otherwise uh, occupied. So, but Exeter itself is on many organizations and many of the, the work groups for the 99 committee. Um, I have been lax with it over the past couple of months because I've been otherwise occupied. Um, will the presentation be shared? Yes. Um, part of the follow-up you will receive will be an email with the recorded presentation. Um, whether a PDF, I don't know. That will come from our marketing group, but I believe there may be a PDF sent as well. You're very welcome. Um, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and I'm glad to share my knowledge with anybody that cares to listen. And I still have almost 20 people on, so apparently people want to listen, and I do thank you all for that. Uh, I've always thought this stuff is fun, and I still think it's fun. So, any other last minute questions before we wrap this up? Okay, it doesn't look it. So I'd like to thank you, everybody. For, oh, thank you and thank you. You're all very welcome. Again, look for the coming months. I have to do some a lot of digging into all of these again to get updated um, screenshots and firmware on them all. But I'm going to be doing uh, subsequent webinars on the actual products that offer the deep packet inspection technology, how what they look like, how they work, what they can do, etc. So I have to set all those up. So again, I thank you all for your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you the next webinar, or you'll see me. So take care. Bye bye now.